Excellent. What's up, guys? Welcome to Probing Paul, episode number 10. Yeah, this is the 10th time I've done this. It's my monthly Q&A session that I do, answering questions from you guys, and all of the questions from today are derived from the comment section from last month's video, Probing Paul, episode 9. Um, which I did from here, and I also apparently wear the, wore the same shirt that I'm wearing this time. I was in the Philippines a month before that, but um, there we go, looking at, at all of the historical probing Pauls back through time. But uh, let's get right to it uh, again, starting with questions asked from you guys. Uh, this is Alex's question. Uh, it's not really a question. He says he saw the beard and he automatically clicked like, and there were a few people who, who agreed with him there. Uh, in case it's not obvious, my beard, my beard has been shaved. I did that yesterday. Uh, I, I soldiered on with it as long as I could. Um, I went through November, like kind of that whole process, and then I kind of kept it into December, and then I was just, I got too busy to shave it. Um, but honestly, it's just, it's, I feel like it's a little bit too much maintenance for me. The ish, it gets itchy and, and all that kind of stuff. It's really easy for me to grow back, though, so I can't promise that, you know, the beard is gone forever. It might come back. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that plays out in the future. Uh, all right, Jake Connor asks, how many monitors is too many monitors? A very good question, Jake. And, um, you know, I, I, I will point out to this uh, picture that was actually linked by uh, a fellow who responded to your question on the comments, which is um, from someone who's doing day trading, like stock trading, with all kinds of monitors. It really depends on what you're doing, but I like three monitors, I think, and then maybe adding a fourth if you want to go that route. Um, if you're going to be just gaming, I think focusing on a single really good monitor for that uh, is a good way to go. And I think 21 by 9 is a great solution for that. So you can even get by with a single monitor in that situ situation, especially if you have the ultra wide. Um, or a single 16 by 9 monitor just as your central gaming monitor, I think should be your primary focus. Beyond that, having two monitors is a big step up. I, am, I have two monitors in pretty much every workstation that I do work at uh, here at home. And then if you can add a third and get three of them, then you can get the whole wraparound thing going, and that's really exciting. You can, you can just get so much work done with that kind of workspace. And then I do like the thing of having the three in the front and adding that fourth one right up above. I think that's a cool solution as well. Beyond that, I think you start to get to the point where you just have too much going on and it becomes more of a distraction than, than helping you keep focused or get work done. But if the question is geared mainly towards gaming, uh, definitely just focus on your single main good monitor first off. Um, but don't throw away your old monitor. Keep your old monitor and use it as a second one because minimum, I think, two, if you want to get anything done, I think is the way to go. That's my advice for that. Thanks for the question, Jake. Uh, Judy uh, asks, do you believe SSD endurance ratings matter? I was just wondering which SSD I would recommend in terms of reliability. I have quite demanding read-write cycles, and I read-write about 60 gigabytes per day. I have options such as OCZ Vector uh, 480, Samsung 850 Evo uh, 1 terabyte, Samsung 850 Pro, WD Blue, OCZ VX. Uh, thank you. Thank you that you're enjoying the videos, and uh, let me see if I can help you out with this question. SSD endurance ratings used to be measured in program erase cycles, PE, PE cycles, um, which kind of refers to the way that data is written to SSDs, but they've kind of updated that, and they, they're now they're listing TBW, or uh, terabytes written, uh, which is usually, sometimes at least in the case of Samsung's warranties here, going to be a time period or the amount you've written to the drive. So if you really hammer the drive, um, they'll take that as your warranty period versus like 10 years or something like that that you might get for an 850 Pro Series. That said, the Pro Series generally do tend to have uh, greater endurability, more total bytes written, as you might see right here. The uh, Pro Series compared to the Evo Series actually kind of doubles um, what you get, or at least what they're expecting. But that's what the manufacturer says, and the manufacturer is going to tell you something that's like, as much as they can promise while still staying within the realm of what they think the expected failure rate will be. So what you'll actually find is that a lot of SSDs can go way, way beyond that. Um, but speaking from a more practical perspective, uh, here's an Anantech article about, um, this is actually by Anand himself, Anand, I should pronounce his name correctly. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> he is talking about total bytes written and, and, a, and a bunch of different factors that go into that. There's other things like write amplification as it's doing trim cycles and that kind of thing. But um, he at least put it out into a chart and they said, assuming 100 binary gigabits written, GIB, uh, how long will each of these drives last? And the, this is 840 series. This is a couple years old now. Um, and even the lowest performing drive, the 120 gig model, they're estimating four years uh, of worth. And that's with like hammering the drive. Uh, 100 gigabits, uh, binary gigabits, gigabytes written per day is a lot. 
Now you said you're using 60 a day, and I did basic math here to indicate that if you're writing, if you're actually writing 60 gigs a day, uh, that will be 22 terabytes per year. And depending on what drive you're using, that may or may not use up that cycle. Um, yeah, but um, to be more realistic, or somewhat more realistic, I'll also direct you guys to this article on Tech Report. It's again a couple years old, but I think it's still very valid. And this is linked in the description. This is by Jeff. And he did like an endurance test with a bunch of different SSDs. Talks about how they die and why they die and NAND running out and all that kind of stuff. But basically after several months of testing, I, I believe it took several months for it to go through, they finally all died, but they took a long time. So, uh, several of the drives got to 600, 700, or 800 terabytes written before they actually kicked the bucket. Uh, the Corsair Neutron GTX got over a petabyte, 1.1 to 1.2 petabytes written. The longest lasting drives in the test were the HyperX drives as well as an 840 Pro, I believe. The HyperX drives went over 2 petabytes and uh, the 840 Pro I think went to 2.2 or 2.4. But um, I mean this is a little bit anecdotal because they were using, they, he just used single drives for all those tests. But more to the point is that what these drives did before they failed was they started throwing smart errors, so that can give you some indication that a drive is about to die. And most of them didn't just die and stop working. And even if you do get through all of the program erase cycles that a NAND chip is capable of doing, most good drives will actually enter a, a, a state called steady state rather than, I guess, solid state. Steady state just means you can't write to the uh, cells anymore, but you can still read from them. So even if the drive did freeze up entirely as far as being not writable to anymore, you should still be able to get the uh, information off that drive. That is, of course, unless your uh, flash controller dies, but flash controller really has nothing to do with durability, and that's something that hasn't been quite as big of a problem, I think, since uh, those older Sandforce uh, controllers got off the market. Okay, I hope that is a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty thorough uh, answer to your question, and I hope that gave you some good info. Anyway, Major McLaren asks, is it worth buying a laptop with a new 10 series graphics card? I would say yes, uh, for a few reasons. One, they're full-size GPUs, so if you get a 1060, 1070, or 1080 from uh, NVIDIA in a laptop, it's the full version of the chip. Uh, and two would be that the best competitors, I feel like, for those GPUs, the discrete mobile GPUs from AMD's side, aren't going to be available for a while. Um, what they're talking about right now with Vega and the GPUs based on Vega uh, probably aren't going to be out in the laptop form via APUs that use Zen and Vega in the same chip. Uh, probably not till the second half of next year. So you still have a while now where I think the 10 series GPUs from NVIDIA are going to be kind of the best gaming performance you can get in a mobile version and a laptop. Now again, they're, they're full-size GPUs, but they're still in a laptop form factor, so often they, they're downclocked a little bit. Uh, some of the specs are very, very slightly different. But I did just get a Razer Blade 16 that I'm working on a video uh, review for that has a 1060 in it, and I think, I think they work really well. Uh, they're very power efficient too, so uh, great solutions if you really need a gaming laptop to take on the go. All right, Jason asks, I was gonna buy a new CPU for Christmas, a 6600K or 6700K, then I heard the new KB Lake CP CPUs are coming out. Should I wait for the new generation of processors or just bite the bullet and get Skylake instead? Now you asked this question, uh, I don't know, three, three to four weeks ago when there was not as much information out as there is now. Now there's certain things I can't really talk about because there are NDAs coming up that uh, I am uh, restrained by, but lots of news, lots of leaks and certain stuff coming out, especially on the AMD side, and they just basically have told everyone their Zen CPUs will be out in the first quarter. First quarter could mean January to March. So it's like a good three, three and a half month time range uh, that, that you'd be waiting for. You're talking about Skylake processors. Uh, KB Lake is also supposed to come out again, rumored at the beginning of 2016, and we don't know exactly when that might be. Again, it could be January, it could be later than that. But yeah, the thing you're looking at right now though, at least is the tail end of like the holiday sales happening. So if you can get a good deal on a 6600K or 6700K, I'd say it'd be worth buying, especially if you don't think you can wait two months, one month, two months, three months uh, to get yourself a system up and running. That said, if you have a system right now that's functional, that's getting you by, I think it's worth it to wait because you'll have KB Lake options, which will give you more options. You might have some price drops on some of the other stuff. You never know. You might see Skylake drop a little bit. And then if Zen really comes out and does do what uh, is expected, um, then you might see some price shuffling as well uh, on the CPU side. So I think 
uh, that assesses it. There, that that yeah, that's what I think about that. Juan asks, "Hey Paul, what brand of 2.5 inch SSD would you recommend for the average consumer? For your average consumer, uh, still being reliable. There are way, way too many options to choose from. I agree, Juan. Um, there are lots of options because there's lots of." Uh, companies that you haven't heard of before that um, can purchase some NAND to get a controller and cobble together a product without too much effort. That said, I like to stick with reputable brands, and I think you should too. Um, the cool thing, at least if you're looking at 2.5 inch SSDs, is since they've been out for a while, and, and since SATA kind of really, they topped out what's, what the SATA bus could, could handle like two years ago, you have a lots of really comparable performance SSDs at the top of the range that are still quite affordable. So all that said, obviously you want to take a close look at what price you're paying, and then I would say just go with a reputable manufacturer, and my list starts with Samsung and Intel, also Crucial, SanDisk, Kingston, Adata, Corsair, Patriot, Mushkin, Plextor, and OCZ, all brands that I would have no problem purchasing an SSD from. And then just look for a good cost per gigabyte, and then make sure that the performance numbers that are listed are there and of course double check your reviews too and see what kind of uh, experience people are having with them uh, you want 450 to 550 megabytes per second reads and writes and most ssds can hit 90 to 95 percent of what the fastest ssds in the range can cost of course if you're looking for really good endurance like i was already talking earlier maybe go with a pro model like an 850 pro um, but by and large you can get again 90 to 95 percent of the performance of the top and 2.5 inch SSDs, even if you're buying the slightly more budget models. Uh, Adata SP550 is one that I've worked with before. Good performance and a really good price. And now I hear that train rolling by, which means I should probably cut this off and start working on my next video. Uh, so stay tuned for that, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed, and of course leave me comments in the comment section, because I will be coming back and answering those next month in Probing Paul number 11, the first one for 2017, and maybe I'll even respond to a few of you who asked me to play a song on the ukulele. Ukulele. I was I was considering doing that, but um you know, my voice is I don't know how my voice is. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. We'll see you next time.